Cette année, la troisième à projet Action Média du Collège André Malraux de Paron est partie aux Pays-Bas pour répondre à la question suivante, les Pays-Bas, un défi contre nature. 30 élèves sont partis découvrir les Pays-Bas pendant 4 jours avec plusieurs trépieds et caméras et beaucoup de questions. Nous sommes partis interviewer des personnes dans les grandes villes des Pays-Bas telles que Amsterdam, Rotterdam et Lelystad, qui est la capitale de la province du Flevoland. Nous avons été répartis en plusieurs petits groupes, puis avons réalisé des reportages dans différents lieux, comme celui de Kinderdijk. Le royaume des Pays-Bas rencontre des difficultés liées à l'aménagement du territoire, comme par exemple, il doit agrandir ses terres jusque sur la mer par manque de place. So like for instance in Roman times, so you know that's the time of, uh, of Christ, um, the city of Utrecht and afterwards the city of Utrecht was much more important, just like Paris was a Roman city and an important Roman city, but here there was nothing, basically. The area was very, a very wet area uh, and not many people were living here uh, along the dunes and along the Rhine. In all the times there, there were more people uh, living in the Netherlands. Uh, and the level of the land goes down. And this means that the people here have to build dikes uh, so that the water doesn't come into the land. And when they, have to st when they start building the dikes, they have to get rid of the, the rainwater. Uh, so, uh, and because of this, we get like a different uh, system of getting rid of the water. The word uh, Amsterdam is like the river Amstel combined with the word Dam. And Dam is basically like uh, uh, the place where you get rid of the, the excess water, you know, too much water. So it's both a place where you defend yourself against the water, but also where you get the water out. If you go through the central station, you will see what is now the River Ai. Uh, and the River Ai, or the, the inlet Ai, is a part of the uh, Zuider Zee. So you have to imagine that, let's say, if this is the sea, uh, and this is the River Amstel, They build a dike over here, right? And they, they start building a dike uh, like over here. Here's the harbor, the first the beginning of the harbor. And then they have water around it. And then they start to, to extend the city. So then they need more water to build. You get a semicircle, half a circle. And then in the middle of the 17th century, uh, and then they build the three major canals Uh, and then you get this sort of beautiful constructed system that looks like, like a real plan. And that means that it becomes like a transit point. It becomes a point of uh, activity. So the beginning of Amsterdam, just like Rotterdam, they become like important uh, transit points. Um, in the early period, uh, the, the city became important for importing grain from uh, the Baltic uh, Sea and the people from Amsterdam were selling herring uh, over their fish, salted fish. Uh, and then after uh, 1580, uh, the city starts to develop because the Netherlands then fights against the Spanish. Uh, the Netherlands becomes independent. And then a lot of people from the Southern Netherlands who are Protestant come to Amsterdam. And these people, you know, you might compare to Um, the function of Manhattan today. Uh, if you want to be an international trade, you need a hub. And in around 1600, Amsterdam becomes the hub, you might say, of world trade. This is where uh, capitalists and merchants from, let's say, uh, all over Europe meet. Italian merchants, uh, Scandinavian merchants, um, and people from the Southern Netherlands. So suddenly, this sort of you know, a relatively small city of about 60,000 people starts to grow quite rapidly to 200,000 people in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, and trade then goes not only to the Baltic, but also to France and the Mediterranean. And very soon afterwards, the trade also picks up to uh, America, Asia, uh, and so on. And, and we tend to think nowadays that water transport is slow Uh, but in those days, water transport is considered uh, efficient um, and smooth. So there is also a public transport system on water connected to the water system in the city itself. So, uh, Amsterdam becomes like a real center of world trade and only in the middle of the 18th century 
London definitely takes over this role from Amsterdam. Uh, so let's say the west part of the Netherlands. The Netherlands is quite small. Eh? I learned at school that France is, I think, 17 times the size of the Netherlands. 17. So it's, so France is very big. The Netherlands is very small. But the purple part uh, is under sea level. And that was already uh, in the Middle Ages. So. Uh, this pumping from the Middle Ages, we had no electricity then, but we had a lot of wind. So really the windmills, when the wind was there, it can move and then the, the mill worked as a pump to bring out the water from the, from the fields to the canals and then from the canals to, uh, to the sea. My name is uh, Peter Paul Klapwijk, Pierre Paul Klapwijk. Uh, we are World Heritage Kinderdijk and we are unique for uh, 1000 years of water management history. To work my windmill, I do it for free. It's very nice to work with uh, history and also it's really nice to work with the elements. To make power from wind is uh, pretty good. This windmill was only working when it was raining because this is below the sea level, two meters, and when it starts raining it would be under the water. So what we have to do is pumping the rainwater out of the fields and uh, by the force of the wind we need all the energy only for pumping the rainwater. We have not enough energy to do something else then because it's so much power that we need for that. In the past it was uh, it all depends on the wind and then when there was for a long time no wind and a heavier rain then we have a big problem because the, the water level is rising but we cannot pump the water and um, we can still see that on the old buildings now that sometimes the water was already uh, one and a half meter high and uh, later they made a stone to remember it that it was so high as, as that that makes the Dutch uh, culture were always fighting against the water and what we know about water management we can also tell now to other people uh, that have problems in, uh, in America uh, by, by a flood. They uh, were asking to the, the Dutch people to help them to, uh, to make uh, solutions for that. Netherlands was neutral during the First World War, but there were many problems with food production. There was a huge uh, storm in 1916 and 20 people were killed. The program uh, adopted by, uh, by the parliament and uh, so that's how it started. Uh, the oldest polder was the northeastern polder, which was reclaimed in 1942. We are here in uh, Oostelijk Flevoland, eastern Flevoland, that was, it was reclaimed in uh, 1957. And then they make the dike, the closure dike, and uh, next to the dikes they made three little islands. Over here, where, where we are now, on this place, over here they made a little island and also over here. And on that island they're building the pumping stations. And they start pumping in the late uh, 1957, pumped for nine months continuously. And then this area was dry, 60,000 hectares. And then in the, in the 60s, they made the last part of the polder. Uh, Lelystad, uh, the main uh, city, it was built in uh, 1967. And uh, the last polder was reclaimed in 1968. The Flevoland is uh, the largest polder in the world. It's a province of the Netherlands, the 12th province of the Netherlands. Before, uh, Flevoland was reclaimed, it was uh, sea. As I said, the Zuider Zee was a very dynamic uh, environment. It was uh, salt water, um, all kinds of salt water fish. After the Zuider Zee uh, was closed off, most uh, of the old 
animals uh, disappeared. And, uh, for some fish, uh, some can, dis can, live in, uh, can live in both freshwater. And so well, another problem was that uh, natural currents disappeared. And especially in the Markemir is that a problem because it's in a kind of aquarium closed off from the rest of the, the world. That is very harmful for uh, the environment. Uh, ecology was not very important. Uh, the main objective was to create new land for uh, cultivation and to protect. They list up this is the capital of Flevoland. You are six meters below sea level. So, 60 years ago, it was all water, the former Southern Sea. And by now, of course, it's a city. From the first moment, this was a reclaimed land from the sea, it was visible. So, there was nothing, only sand, no house, no tree, nothing because it had been water. And of course, the Dutch are quite famous for their techniques in how to reclaim land from the sea. When Lelystad was designed on the drawing tables, they thought, okay, we are going to make a whole new province. And in the middle, we put the city of Lelystad. So when the whole pump station is running, it's 2000 cubic meters in a minute. The diesel uh, engine runs on uh, diesel, gasoline, 160 liters of uh, gasoline in an hour. This, the cost of keep, uh, keeping the polder dry is, is high. Our electrical uh, bill for the pumping stations is one and, a half one and a half million euros in a year. It's each year. <laughs> In 1953, so then we had really a big disaster. All this area here uh, was flooded. After 1953, they spent a lot of more money to protect us. So the dikes become higher to protect us. We also made in the sea, uh, uh, what how do you call it, a sluis, and it can be open for the fish, and uh, but it can also be closed when the sea level was very high. And so now it is a touristical attraction. Especially when you look in our history of our country, the last 1200 years, our country is flooded from 40 times. And after the last flooding in 1953, we said, no more. It's a lot of water coming from the rivers, uh, two main rivers from Europe, use our country to find the open sea. So the river Meuse and the river Rhine. So this is part Rhine and part Meuse river. And that side, the North Sea. So normally, at these water levels, it's not necessary when we have a threat of an increased level of three meters or more above normal sea level, then the barrier will close itself. The gates, the arms, here we have inside this chamber is the ball joint, like your shoulder, and this is the very firm concrete piece that must absorb the force. Yeah, so there's a lot of force to reckon with during a storm. To imagine that this is the Eiffel Tower on the side and the steel is 9 cm. Uh, the other one takes over and that's how we do. Because directly 10 million people in the Netherlands live, work, sleep below sea level. So that's why we have the highest safety standards in the world. Can you pay for it? But also the quality and the quantity of the water. The next step is prevent a country for the sea level rising, for the climate change. And to give an idea, we invest 1 billion euro every year. It's a lot of money. If you do not, a country is flooded and you have to swim. And the climate is changing and we don't look for what is tomorrow, what is next week. 
Next year we are busy what happens in 2100. He is not for me, but it's for people like your age. Special organization with elections only for water. This arrives already from Middle Ages because uh, water was so close, the sea, the river, uh, groundwater. So people had to organize themselves to, to, to live at this place and not drown immediately in the first year. So they have to work together to make together the dikes and, and things like that to protect against uh, the water. So for us, the only idea is when we work worldwide together, we can solve the problem. My name is Diego. I uh, live here for 19 years now in this area. Mm, the origin is a long time ago. We are here for 20 years now. And the plan started 25 years ago. This was uh, for the drinking water company terrain. And when the drinking water company moved to another place, they decided to build houses here. So 25 years ago, they started to make plans for this ecological area. Um, this was one of the first ecological areas in Amsterdam, in Holland. So I think there are certain reasons why people like to live here, because it was an ecological area, but also because it's not very far from the center, because it's car free, uh, the whole terrain, there are no cars, so it's very nice for children to play. Uh, the old area around had very small houses, very old houses, and people want to have a bigger and better house. And you have a lot of interaction with your neighbors. We have a summer party, we have a New Year's party. Uh, we have all kinds of moments where you can meet your neighbors. Um, people interact here very much, and this is something they thought about when they started the area. Uh, uh, it's safe, it's green. This is spring, but it's getting much greener in summer. Uh, you can hear the birds and still you're 10 minutes from the Dam Square in the middle of Amsterdam. How long it take to design this? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that maybe the design period was two years or two and a half years approximately. So advised to you have just a brick wall of the building, but we make these little uh, boxes with a little hole in it. So they are very important for uh, capturing little birds in the neighborhood. If you uh, have your car there, you are not allowed to use clean water to, to, for cleaning your cars or to give to, uh, water to your plants in the gardens. But when it was raining, the water was collected in this reservoir. So you're obliged to, to use the water from the, from the reservoir. So that was also important. That was quite new in that period. It's for um, to do the trash in different sections. Normal waste, you have paper, you have glass. As I think everyone knows now, but 20 years ago, it was quite new. If you build 600 new apartments, you will have, a, how do you call it, a peak in using energy. You, we had to make a heat station of electricity station for the peak moment. J'habite ici depuis 4 ans et demi. Il y a 600 appartements. La moitié des, des, des appartements ici, des, des logements, sont des appartements sociaux. J'ai toujours habité dans, dans les alentours, donc je connaissais déjà le quartier. J'avais des, des amis qui habitaient ici, mais il y a plein de choses que je ne savais pas sur ce quartier non plus. Et euh, j'ai appris à connaître ce quartier en habitant ici. Le fait que rien que quand je déménageais dans mon, dans mon bloc qui est ici derrière, tous les voisins sont venus me dire bonjour, me demander si j'avais besoin de quelque chose. Euh, euh, C'est très, directement très accueillant, très social. Et quand, on vient, quand on vient habiter ici, on perd son permis de, de parking. Donc il faut louer un garage ou bien se débarrasser de sa voiture. Tout le monde va en vé à vélo ici. Hein. Euh, les enfants, euh, part, dès qu'ils savent rouler à vélo, 6 ans, ils vont à vélo. Jusqu'au troisième âge, on le fait. L'architecture, bon, au dehors, ça se ressemble beaucoup. Il y a beaucoup les mêmes matériaux, il y a quelques façades qui sont différentes, mais c'est un peu les mêmes blocs. Ce que moi j'aime bien, c'est les... Euh, oh ben, il y a plein d'endroits qui sont sympas, en fait. Ce n'est pas un parc qui est ouvert partout. Il y a plein de petits endroits qui sont en fait publics, où, on peut, où tout le monde peut aller. 
qui sont très, euh, très cosy, très, euh, très privés, très euh, agréables. Le quartier, il est réel, mais il est... Euh... Non, on n'est pas rêveur ici. On est réaliste. Today, this year, is a special year. In September, 50 years ago, the first people came to live over here in Lelystad. Well, uh, the city has uh, 77,000 inhabitants, but uh, the city is actually quite big. Uh, then we have lots of water. So you, you already have seen uh, that the city has grown, has grown a lot. Lelystad is one of the bigger, not the biggest, the biggest one is Amsterdam, of course, but uh, one of the bigger cities in, uh, in the Netherlands and certainly also one of the bigger cities in, uh, in Flevoland. Just everywhere in this city you see green spots and areas. It's of course strange, you have a sea or a lake and you make a city of this lake. That's not regular. Uh, but I think uh, we managed to build with nature. I think the spirit of the city to try uh, to experience, uh, to innovate. My name is Lijn Verbeek. I'm commissioner of the King of the province of Flevoland. It's relatively easy in a situation like ours because we do not have old situations. Everything is new. At this moment about 60% of all the energy used by everybody in this province is alternative energy and we will reach in about 15 years we expect to reach 100%. And also the companies, most of the companies are, are very new so they can quite easily organize themselves in a sustainable way. I already talked a little about the, the windmills. Most of the renewable energy comes from the windmills. We have about 600 of them at the moment, uh, and, but we're already working on the third generation of windmills. If you look to the first generation, it's about 20, 30 years ago. Technically spoken, these could only live for about 20 years. And now the third and the fourth generation can live much longer because we develop new materials. Uh, they're called composites. The composites is a new type of material and that's what we're doing at the moment. So we have a change. We are replacing all the old mills by new mills who are also larger. Uh, and this works very well. Uh, we force the companies who build the mills that they must offer all the people who live around the mill they can take shares in the mill, so they have a profit out of the mill also. And that's the reason why there's no opposition in building mills. There's a very large area of biological and organic farming. And they are very in in interesting, in my opinion, what they're doing. Because uh, originally the organic farming used to be small farms. But now they are using innovative technologies to do organic farming on a large scale. And he has a an, an, an machine on his tractor that is connected to the satellites. And this machine can read uh, coordinates of GPS. And when he is putting seeds in his land, this machine puts in a computer the GPS coordinates of each individual seed. And then he puts the, the information of the GPS of the seeds, he puts it in another machine. And then during the summer, this machine weeds the weeds away but the machine knows exactly what is a weed and which is a grain that should stay. Within two millimeters he knows. So he doesn't need chemicals anymore to put the weeds away. Yeah. The farmers own their own drones and he makes the drone fly over his land. And the drone has an eye and the eye can read what the grains are doing. In the, and the tractor knows for each square meter what to do. You can triple the harvest per hectare by this kind of techniques can produce sufficiently food for everybody in the world. And I work for an organization uh, and we uh, are not profit organization. 
so people pay tax and from this money we organize the affairs around uh, water and sanitation. All these people together produce waste and we have to deal with waste in the city to have a good living environment, eh? to have clean enough water. Uh, this one is um, maybe um, you can swim. I have been swimming here. Uh, has only been um, connected to sewage in 1987. So uh, um, it's, it's not long ago, well, I can still remember the dirt f flowing into the canals. But then in 2006, we built a new one uh, west of the city and uh, connected a sewage around the city. So if you, if you flush the toilet here, uh, uh, the shit goes uh, that way, poured it over kilometers all the way back west. My name is Sandra, I work at the province of Flevoland and I'm project manager for a project at the moment in the Markermeer area. The Markermeer is a fresh water lake in the middle of the Netherlands. And the Markermeer was supposed to be another polder, but they decided in 2006 that they are not going to build a polder anymore. And now it's fresh water in a closed off uh, artificial system, so it's totally different. There must be movement in the water, but this area is too, too shallow. And that means that the quality of the water goes down so much that we had to investigate with the, our engineers to find a solution to get more movement in the water. And mathematically we have calculated in this area for a way that if you make a connection between the water and the wind, then you might get movement if you manipulate the water enough by building islands. Um, and now we're building new islands in the Markermeer and that's the Marker Wadden. That island is for, uh, for ecology, for nature and well, people are allowed to visit it when it's finished. It's an experiment. So we are all very excited. We are making the isles now and we expect them to, in the future, the coming years, that the movement of the water will change. Some engineers say it work, will work beautiful and others say it, it's a stupid plan. And I like that situation. The, they fight each other and we'll see what happens. Yes. We'll see what happens. It's a very interesting uh, experiment. Yeah. And we're taking first sand from the lake. We have our own sand winning location here to build dams and we will fill the, the lakes within the sand dams with material, with clay, also from the lake and there will be nature. So this nature, this will be very sandy and very uh, muddy but also with a lot of water. So this will be especially very good for birds. So we expect to be this a bird paradise. Yeah, it's uh, 500 hectares, so it's comparable with a thousand football fields. It will take two years to finish this project. And in, from, you are one of the first visitors, and I think the first visitors from France. The whole blue area, the water, is protected by Natura 2000. So the animals, the birds that live here are protected. So uh, we can't uh, do anything that do harm to that birds. By investing in nature here, like Marco Bada, we try to uh, get uh, more birds. Uh, in Holland we made, Holland we made nature. Eh? It's, it's different, diff different, it's all man-made. So, and that's the most important thing, I think. If you look at uh, a place like this, we are trying to protect for the water and uh, what do we think about the future? Uh, I think the challenge of this century will be uh, enormous because uh, of climate change, the sea level will rise 
And if you uh, see uh, from the Alps River Rhine going to the delta below sea level and when the sea level rises, it's a big challenge to keep this, uh, this area livable. If I look at our water system, this European law is um, very important to, uh, to uh, have the, yeah, the urge of cleaning it and making it livable. And now uh, by European law there's more urge to do it and it really is effective in Europe. Mm -hmm.